Hello and welcome to the second part of the series about distributions. As promised, here we talk about the so-called test functions. I already told you, a good visualization is always to see such a function as a measurement device, which means you only get back values in a very small region. Indeed, this one would be a typical sketch. An important thing to note is that here the function is zero and also here. To this point, everything we considered was one dimensional, which means the function has only one variable, but now I want to consider all functions with n variables. In other words, we have a function phi that maps rn to r. Indeed, we could also choose the complex numbers on the right hand side. This does not change so much as we can see later. Now we can start with the definition, which is the space of test functions. Indeed, for this one, we have a standard notation, one uses a curve D. And if you want to emphasize the domain of definition, we put that after the D. Okay, let's write down the definition step by step. We know we want at least continuous functions defined on Rn. Of course we want more, and as you can see in the graph, it is smooth, and indeed we want the best smoothness. Hence we look at functions that are differentiable, arbitrarily often, and we usually denote that with the infinity symbol here. And the second property was that the function is the zero function outside of a bounded set. Such functions are called functions with compact support and we denote that with a lowercase c here. So these are the two important properties when we talk about the test functions, so please remember them. And what exactly the support is, I will explain in the end of this video. Now we know what the set d is, but of course we have a little bit more structure here. The first thing you should notice with your analysis in linear algebra knowledge is that we have a vector space structure. It could be a real or a complex vector space depending which values we allow. In particular this means if you choose two functions out of our space, then the sum is still differentiable, arbitrarily often, and it vanishes outside of a bounded set. You see that's nice enough, but in fact we want even more. We want a specific notion of convergence for this space. Later I will explain why we want that and what it exactly is. At this point I can at least tell you that we get this convergence if we choose a suitable topology or a suitable metric. What is not sufficient is to choose just a norm on the vector space, then we don't get our specific convergence out. To be honest, we will have the same problem when using a metric, but let's deal with this in the next video. Now, if you never heard of any of these terms, that is not a problem, we will discuss them later in all detail. However, first let's start with some easy examples. As promised, we do this in n dimensions, so all our test functions are defined on Rn and mapped into the real numbers R. Now the simplest example is of course the function that is zero everywhere. Both properties are fulfilled because it is zero outside of a bounded set and you can form all the derivatives as often as you want and they all exist. Okay, easy and simple. Not so easy is then to find another function. So we choose two cases here and of course zero is the first case where the zero outside of the unit ball. Which means I choose here the normal Euclidean norm and say this is greater or equal than one. And inside the unit ball I choose the exponential function of one over one minus and also the Euclidean norm, and the best thing is to choose it squared. Indeed, this function looks more or less like the function we had at the beginning. So maybe let's sketch here the example in a two-dimensional case, so R2 to R. 
Then the unit ball is just the circle. And then the graph of the function would be such a two-dimensional bump above this circle. Now that we have indeed a C infinity function here is something you can just calculate. And indeed, I think you can do it. However, I now skip these calculations because later on we will have much better methods to prove such a statement. Now for the rest of this video, I want to fix some notations we will use in all the other videos. As promised above, I want to explain what the support of a function is. The notation one uses is just SUPP of the given function. And please be careful, this does not denote the supremum. Always look if you find two P's or just one. The support is a subset of Rn and it is the smallest closed subset where the function is supported. More concretely, it's the collection of all points in Rn where the function phi of x is not zero. Because we want a closed subset of Rn, we have to add the closure above. Now in Rn it is very easy. If the support is bounded, we can add that it's also closed and then we just say it's a compact support. Now for the next part, I want short notations for the partial derivatives. For this, the multi-index notation is very useful and we just choose natural numbers alpha 1 till alpha n, where we also include 0. Putting these numbers in a tuple, we call this alpha then just a multi-index. Such a multi-index alpha is very helpful because now we can define the symbol d alpha. In this d alpha, there are all the informations for the partial derivatives. For example, alpha 1 tells us that we have to form the derivative with respect to x1 alpha times. So I would write partial derivative with respect to x1 and alpha 1 times. The same goes for the second variable x2 and there we have alpha 2. And in the end we reach xn alpha n times. Now if this is the first time you've seen that, then of course a quick example would be helpful. Again let's look at a two-dimensional example. So we have two variables x1, x2 and maybe the function is given as 2x1 squared times x2 cubed. And let's choose our multi-index alpha as 2, 1. Then d alpha f is again a function depending of two variables and given by the partial derivatives two times with respect to x1 and only one partial derivative with respect to x2. And then we put the function behind. In the first step we get 6x1 and x2 squared. And the second derivative with respect to x1 gets us to 12x2 squared. Now if you understand this new symbol d alpha, then we can rewrite our c infinity functions. In short, a function is in c infinity if all the functions d alpha f make sense no matter what the multi-index alpha is. Putting this into formulas we can write phi is in c infinity of rn if and only if d alpha f lies in the continuous functions on rn. Namely for all possible multi-indices alpha one can choose. With this knowledge we will form more test functions in the next video and I will also explain what this special convergence from above indeed means. Well then, see you in the next video and thanks for listening. Bye.